stopping. Oh, there it goes. It's working? Yeah. Sorry. Praise the Lord. <laughs> <laughs>
We call this today, we call that forgiveness, huge debt, gone, removed, wiped away. We call that today our salvation experience. How many heard Nina's salvation experience this morning? That's exactly what I'm talking about, a salvation experience. Yours might have been dramatic. It may not have been dramatic, but, but we have this experience, and this experience is real, and it's powerful, and, it, and it's amazing, and it's overwhelming, and it'll change your life. And so we have this experience, and again, to whatever degree, and, and we've, dis, we've decided that because this experience is so powerful and so real, it was real to you, right? It changed your life. Because this experience is so real and powerful, we've, dis, we've decided that it's proof that my eternity is all set. Right? Isn't that, what we, isn't that what we all believe? I've had this experience, I've had this moment, or I've had this decision, or I've had this ex, you know, time where, where I turned my life around, or God forgave me this huge debt. I've had this experience, and so I've automatically just, I don't know if I can say assumed, but, but we've had a lot of help, but we just assume, because that experience is so real, That it means I'm now going to spend eternity with God. And I'm submitting to you that it does not. And this is news. (laughs) Because the unforgiving debtor, he had that experience, right? Now let's put ourselves back 2,000 years ago, before the Bible. All they had was what? Jesus' words. Isn't that right? That's all they had. And then the first generation church, after Jesus was gone, they had eyewitnesses who would testify to Jesus' words. That's what they had. That's why they got it so right. They just based everything on Jesus' words. And his words say, this guy was spared, he was saved. We would say today, he had a new birth, a new lease on life, born again, a fresh start. He had some type of epiphany from God. He made a decision, maybe he's a a mental uh, guy that doesn't care for emotions or feelings, so he just made a decision for Christ, and that's that's wonderful too. Uh, The important thing is, his debt was forgiven, his sins were forgiven. And Jesus told this story. But how many know the story doesn't end there? Isn't that glorious? That's a glorious story, but the story doesn't end there, right? Because of what happened. His fellow debtor came to him and said, give me some time to pay my 2,000. He, now remember, he owed 375 tons, and it was forgiven. And his neighbor, his, his friend, his co-worker, whatever it was, owed him a couple thousand dollars comparatively, And he said, give me some more time to pay. And what did the guy who had this experience now, he had this real powerful experience, and what did he do to that fellow servant? He had him thrown in jail, right? And does the story stop there? Then what happens? Remember, first generation church, this is all they had, these stories. Then what happened? the king calls the first guy in and says, you evil servant, wait, he had the experience. Don't we say if you have the experience that proves you're you're all set? Isn't that what we say? Isn't that what we've learned all our lives? You've had the experience, you're all set. But what they had was this story. And if I came along and I said, John, you've had this amazing experience. You're all set now. John would say, no, that's not right. That's not what Jesus taught. Because now, if you don't treat others right, your salvation experience means nothing. Isn't that the story? I'm not making this up, am I? I feel, I feel like I'm half nuts because I've, I've been a Christian for almost 50 years. And nobody's ever told me that your eternal destiny, where you're going to spend eternity, is based on how you treat others after you've had this wonderful, life-changing, 
experience. Nobody's ever told me that. Didn't that guy, that unforgiving debtor, wasn't he still judged and condemned on Judgment Day? <laughs> you remember what Jesus said, just in case we don't get it? You remember what he said? So shall my heavenly Father do to you if you don't treat others right. Wow. Well, that's, that wasn't all. <clears throat> he, w he went on to say, he told a story about the Good Samaritan. We remember that story, right? You'll find it in Luke 10. Amen. We remember that story. And a guy came up to him, a very smart, intelligent guy came up to him and said, Good master, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said, well, how do you read the scriptures? What does it say? And the guy answered right. He said, love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus said, right. And then remember the rest of the story? Then, how many know it doesn't stop there, right? The story goes on. And he says, uh, who's my neighbor? And the Bible says he's trying to justify himself. In other words, he's trying to get out of something. And that's when Jesus told the story of the Good Samaritan, right? The Good Samaritan. And what's the bottom line of that story? Go and do likewise. Go be like. What's the original question? Jesus, how do I inherit eternal life? And the answer was, go and do likewise, or go be a Good Samaritan. Wouldn't you agree with me? That sounds a lot like, just go treat. You don't have to be a, a spiritual giant. Just go treat others right. Especially those in trouble. And what? You'll inherit eternal life. I'm submitting to you today that how you treat others determines where you're going to spend eternity. Remember, first-generation church, that's all they had, right? They had these stories. If somebody, if somebody walked up and said, uh, Dale, how do I inherit eternal life? Dale would be like, oh, I remember what Jesus said. Who remembers another part of this story that Jesus, it wasn't even part of the answer. He just threw in there. Anybody remember? A priest and a Levite walked by. He just threw that in. It's not part of the answer. He throws in the priest and the Levite. And what did they do? Would you agree with me that a priest and a Levite treated others right? I assume that's why he put it in there, right? <laughs> he wanted to contrast what treating others right looked like. An indifference, lukewarm, not engaged, too busy, got my own stuff. What that looks like. Would you agree with me? The priest and the Levite, it does not appear to me that they have inherited eternal life. A priest, a Levite. Really had no bearing on their eternal life. What did? How you treat others. That's all they had now. That's all they had was these stories from Jesus, the eyewitness accounts. That's why the apostles, that's why their words were so powerful in the first generation church. Their words were so powerful because they're the ones that heard Jesus. They knew exactly what he said. Would you agree with me that if you heard Jesus tell you that unforgiving debtor story, that you would ever, do you, do you forget a story like that? If Jesus looks at me and says, Rick, that's what my heavenly Father will do to you if you do not treat others right? You, are you ever going to forget that story? If somebody comes along and offers a different gospel, a salvation based on experience and not on how you treat others, aren't you going to realize that, wait a minute, that, that, that's not what Jesus said. They had these stories. He had another one. We mentioned this one last week. 
I finally figured out what the sheep and the goats is. It's a prophecy. I have always, I would be like, well, I know it's not a story because it's really going to happen. Well, Jesus was just foretelling what was going to actually happen. The sheep and the goats story that he tells is actually a prophecy of what's going to happen to you one day. You. You're either going to be a sheep or you're going to be a goat. There are no options. One or the other. And sheep were people who did what? Obeyed. Obeyed that's a good one. Hmm? Followed. Followed. Helped people. Helped people. Anybody else? Anybody else know what sheep did? Feed the hungry. Fed the hungry. It's one of the things sheep did. Would you agree with me that it seems like sheep were people who treated others right. That's what Jesus said. And do you remember the goats? Remember what he said to the goats? To the sheep he said, come, enter into the kingdom of God prepared for you from the foundation of the world. And do you remember what he said to the goats? Depart from me. You're cursed into eternal fire. Do you remember what goats were? They refused to do good and help They were just people who refused. Same, same type of people as the priest and the Levite. I'm submitting to you that the church had these stories about salvation, about judgment day, about how to pass from judgment on that coming day. And they had these stories. And these stories all came down to one thing. How you treat others is going to determine where you spend eternity. I don't know if that's important to you or not, but it's really important to me. Everybody say 67. 67. I'm a lot closer to that day than I used to be. 67. So this idea of how do you pass, <laughs> you know, the test is coming up pretty soon. How do you pass? Really important to me. And based on these teachings, remember what we said at the beginning? If you want to seek the truth, if you want to know the truth, why don't you just go directly to Jesus? Why do you go to anybody else when you have his words? His words say how we treat others. Sermon on the Mount, same thing. Nina mentioned it today. The merciful obtain mercy. Because if you do not forgive, remember the Lord's Prayer? Father, forgive us as we forgive our debtors. Because, and then at the end he says, because if you do not forgive, neither will your Father forgive you. See, but we just, we really just throw all those stories out. We throw the Sermon on the Mount out. We throw it all out. And you know what we say? You've had a salvation experience. You're all set. Your eternity is settled. And that's not what Jesus taught. How we treat others here after the experience <laughs> determines eternity. And this was our text for the last few weeks. We'll just read it real quick. Oh, Paul's writing Romans 13, 8, after his Roman road to salvation. Oh, no, nothing to anyone except for your obligation or debt to love one another. If you love your neighbor, you fulfill the requirements of God. And verse 10, love does no wrong to others, so love fulfills the requirements of God. This debt of love, a debt of love to our neighbor, or how we treat our neighbors. All right. <clears throat> I believe this can help us. That, and, and, to, and in my mind, I, I, have a, I have a very analytical mind, and so I know the Bible really, really well. I've spent tens of thousands of hours studying it and analyzing it and meditating about it and writing about it and talking about it. Literally tens of thousands of hours. And I've tried to make all this stuff fit together. And this is the way that I see it fitting together after all this time. This is the way I see it fitting together. What we've called, what we call this 
amazing, overwhelming, real, powerful, life-changing salvation experience. It is an awakening. It's real, it's powerful, it's everything you believe it to be. And I'm submitting to you that it is an awakening. You are now spiritually awake. It is not, listen, it is not proof that you're going to treat others right from now on. It's not proof of where you're going to spend eternity. But it is a spiritual awakening. And it's real and powerful and everything the scriptures say it is. Just like that unforgiving debtor, his experience was just, just uh, astounding. Beyond description. So we have this spiritual awakening. I had one at 19, just like Nina described. I mean, I had this awakening. Man, I was awake to the spirit, you know. You're, you're alert now, you're aware, and it was real. And, and I've, I've shared this before, but it, it was so real to me that the grass looked greener and the sky looked bluer. I'm not kidding. I, just, I could hear melodies and the wind and the birds. and It was, just, it was like a new world. Amen. And I'm submitting to you the church is made up of people who have had some type of encounter with Jesus. And I'm submitting further to you that that is your spiritual awakening. It is your birth. It is, but just like a physical birth, it, a physical birth does not determine what kind of person you are. That remains to be seen. How you treat others remains to be seen. What you do after this amazing, mesmerizing, wonderful, life-changing experience, what you do after you're awake. And you know what we do after we are awake? We just camp at awake. We just think, oh, this is wonderful to be awake. Just kind of resting in our laurels. It's so wonderful to be awake. And that's not the purpose of waking up. Listen, you know what you're actually awake to? You're awake to a debt that you owe. You now are spiritually aware that I have a debt of love to pay back to humanity. That's what you're awake to. Awake to love. Awake to righteousness. All right, well, let's look at this idea in Scripture. Look at 1 John. Now, this is John's the, the, one of the apostles. He's the eyewitness to these, all these stories we talked about. He heard them all with his own ears, from the mouth of Jesus, front row. And he says, 1 John 3, 14, King James Version, he says, we know. Everybody say, we know. We know. This is a good thing to know. We know that we have passed from death unto life. How many think that's a good thing to know? You don't have to go through life wondering. You don't have to go through life thinking, oh no, am I going to get in or not get in? Am I going to be judged and condemned or am I not going to be judged and condemned? I can tell you exactly. John said, based on everything I heard Jesus say, you can know you have passed from death unto life. Because, everybody say because. Because. And what do we say? Isn't that what we usually say? Because I believe in Jesus. When Jesus himself said, many are going to say, Lord, Lord, to me on that day. Because of his wonderful work, because he forgave me that huge debt. It's almost like what's funny to me is we will answer this question or the fill in the blank with almost anything except what the Bible says. Isn't that, don't, isn't that kind of astounding? We'll answer it in our own minds. Anything except what the Bible says. No looking at your phone. No, I'm typing your first No, I thought you were trying to find out what the because. <laughs> I thought you were trying to fill in the blank. How do we answer it? How do, 
how do I, in my own mind, how do I say, Rick, I know that you've passed from death unto life because. What do you say? How do you say? If you'd have asked me most of the time of my life, I would have said, because I had a personal experience with Jesus. That's what I would have said. I've told thousands of people that. Our glorious salvation experience. We know that we've passed from death unto life because... Anybody have any guesses? Not you. Anybody have any guesses? I'll give you a hint. It has to do with my subject today. Treat others right. That's how you can know. Are you kidding? Is that what the Bible says? <laughs> well, let's just see. We know that we've passed from death unto life because I still can't tell you. <laughs> we'll say anything. Isn't that right? We'll say anything that proves. And, and we'll say, this proves I have eternal life. This proves I in, have inherited eternal life. This proves I have passed from death unto life. This proves that I'm not going to come into judgment on that day, that I've passed from judgment. These are all real important things to me. And we will answer almost anything except we know that we've passed from death unto life because we what? That's your only way you're going to know. You might say you know some other way, but the only way to actually know is to look at your life, take stock, and say, how am I treating others? And specifically, as Maria said, how am I treating the poor, the hungry, the thirsty, the naked, the sick, the imprisoned, the shelterless? How am I treating these people, the man in the ditch? the people in trouble, how am I actually treating them? Am I kind of lean more towards that indifferent, non-engaged, lukewarm, kind of not active at all? Or, I'm at, or am, am I actually get in the game? Zealous of good works, the Bible says. So instead of actually do it, we just, we just come up with a whole new religion. Just a whole new religion. I don't want to do that, so we'll just come up with a whole new religion. Hey, guess what? In my religion, your salvation experience proves you're eternally saved. Well, yeah, that's, let's do that instead. <clears throat> Because we love the brethren. He that loves not his brother abides in death. And I'm submitting to you today, how you treat others will determine where you spend eternity. Wow. All right. Let's look at this last day. The prophet Malachi looked at this last day. We're almost done. Thanks for staying with me. The prophet Malachi, verse 317, they will be my people, says the Lord of heaven's armies. On the day when I act in judgment, they will be my own special treasure. I will spare them as a father spares an obedient child. Then you will again see the difference between the righteous and the wicked, between those who serve God and those who do not. Then he goes on, there, there's no break between chapter, the end of chapter 3 and chapter 1, or, or verse 1 of chapter 4. He goes on, continues to say, the Lord of heaven's army says, the day of judgment is coming, burning like a furnace. On that day, the arrogant and the wicked will be burned up like straw. They will be consumed, roots, branches, and all. How many agree with me that that sounds a lot like, so will my heavenly Father do to you, <laughs> if you don't forgive? Doesn't that sound a lot like, uh, goats away with me, depart you cursed ones into eternal fire. It sounds like the same thing. The prophet Malachi is saying the same thing that Jesus was saying. And he says, but, look at this, for you who fear my name, the son of righteousness will rise with healing in his wings and you'll go free, leaping with joy like calves let out to pasture. 
that you'll know the difference between the righteous and the wicked. And I'd submit to you today that that difference is how you treat others. Amen. 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 Uh, let's thank uh, Facebook for joining us today.